And there are many identities that come into zine fairs from non-binary identities, fat activism, Islamic identities, but really the, the ultimate type of people I relate to are quiet people who go to libraries. And this is my book launch as well. So this is my debut book, Shy Radicals, which I've worked on for the last three years, um, which is like um, about a militant, anti-imperialist, radical political party, like the Black Panthers, but for shy people. Um, Nina Power here um, has uh, written the preface for the book, which the publisher said would be like Jean-Paul Sartre writing to France Fanon's Wretched of the Earth. Um, so Nina's going to start us talking about one of the uh, icons of uh, introvert resistance. Actually, to start off with, I'd just like to mention, this is from a book called Introvert Doodles, which is one of the best books ever written, um, which is one of the few books which make me feel normal. And it says, extroverts may rule the world, but introverts create worlds. So we're going to start off talking about uh, an icon of the... Uh, resistance of introverts and quiet people, who is Lisa Simpson. So, ne Nina Power. Um, Hamja asked me to speak a bit about Lisa Simpson, who is an a <laughs> introvert icon in many ways and uh, celebrates many of the things that Hamja celebrates, such as uh, reading and thinking and um, standing up, I suppose, for justice and what's right. Um, so what I was going to do is just speak through a few I of my favourite images of Lisa. This is where Lisa hallucinates after drinking water um, from a ride at Duff Gardens Amusement Park. Um, I think Lisa um, performing the role of Lizard Queen is a, is a kind of a beautiful and parodic instance of um, her otherwise relative powerlessness uh, in the world uh, in, in terms of her relation to her family, uh, her relation to school and her relation to uh, <laughs> larger society. Um, and I think there's something inspirational about Lisa's hallucinogenic um, moment as the Lizard Queen, uh, which we should all aspire to. Okay, I want to stress Lisa's politics. So here is a very kind of uh, actually quite infamous <laughs> episode um, from 2004 in which Lisa supports um, the right for the demand for Cornish independence and she says free Cornwall now in, uh, in Cornish um, and I recently went to St Ives and the Cornish liberation movement is a very interesting thing indeed um, and I kind of appreciate Lisa's love of small causes um, and her appreciation and support for those who struggle for independence of any kind. Um, okay, this is probably, I guess, the classic image of Lisa as a kind of reader. Um, in fact, there's an online book club that's been set up where you can... Um, it lists all of the books that Lisa is spotted reading throughout the, all of the Simpsons episodes, and you two can uh, read, read up on everything that Lisa has read as an eight-year-old. Um, I think this picture of her with the bell jar, I sh this is the book that she's seen with most. Um, and there's obviously something very important about Lisa's identification with Sylvia Plath, although I think Sylvia Plath is, is a slightly contentious figure uh, in the Shy Radicals canon, um, because there's a kind of paradox or ambivalence about, I don't know, speaking very uh, loudly in a certain way about one's own inner turmoil because it's one of the difficult things. Uh, it's something that Lisa finds very difficult too, not least because she doesn't often have many friends uh, to talk to. Okay. <laughs> on, that, on that point. Um, and I think this Lisa's kind of profound loneliness, it's not a, in a sense anything she does, but again it's this kind of context in which she, uh, you know, in a groundhog way finds herself completely trapped in, you know, and the fact that she can never age. I mean, although we do have the episodes where she's projected as, in the future, as the, the President of the United States or as a successful uh, scientist or whatnot, there are some episodes where we look forward to Lisa's uh, future um, and where we often see Bart failing uh, in a way. So that being, the, the, the point being, I suppose, that being kind of popular and funny at school is never a guarantee of uh, how you will do afterwards. Uh, and I think Lisa is supposed to represent this kind of uh, absolute isolation and turmoil that you uh, that one often suffers as a, as a school child, and at school in particular. Um, I want to stress Lisa's role as a, as a feminist. Um, I think she's an excellent feminist icon um, for younger and older uh, people alike. Um, this uh, image is from one of the Treehouse of Horror episodes, um, but we can think of other episodes where 
For example, she takes down the corporate um, patriarchal toy industry um, where they, they take the, the mickey out of Barbie and, and uh, with their version of Malibu Stacy in which she replaced, changes the, the voice um, and brings out her own, her own doll, um, which has lots of kind of positive things to say. Um, there's one episode where Marge says to Lisa that you're never going to get a husband by being sarcastic. And Lisa responds, all right, no husband. Um, I really like drunk Lisa, <laughs> for personal reasons, uh, perhaps. Um, and I think what, what's interesting when Lisa gets drunk or, or hallucinates is that she kind of speaks the truth. I mean, obviously, we might say in Vino Veritas, it's a kind of common idea that when people get drunk, they say the truth. I don't think that's necessarily accurate in uh, human life, but certainly when Lisa um, gets drunk, she tends to become really, really sardonic uh, and even more sarcastic. Um, and I think much more, I don't know, nihilistic in a certain kind of way, actually. Um, and I kind of appreciate this sort of, uh, the bleakness um, of her realization of, of her situation. Um, okay, and I wanted to finish maybe on a positive image where Lisa lists the things that she likes because this is just sort of unbelievably cute. Um, my interests include music, science, justice, animals, shapes, and feelings. And I think Hamja's book is uh, a kind of similar list uh, of things and also very uh, moving and uh, human in the way that Lisa Simpson is as, as someone we can identify with and, uh, yeah, and, I don't know, enjoy and like. So hopefully Hamja's book will, uh, will remind you of Lisa Simpson as well. So that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, um, the next speaker is um, Joe Moran, who's come all the way from Liverpool. Joe's written an excellent book called um, Shrinking Violets, A Field Guide to Shyness, which has um, really made quite a stir, um, and it's a, a cultural history of shyness. Um, so, Joe. Hello. Uh, thank, thanks, Hamza. Um, yeah, I, I write about shyness. Um, this session is uh, titled Shy, Introverted or, and or, Autistic Identities and Resistance. Uh, shyness is not the same as introversion or autism, although there are interesting parallels that we can probably talk about. Um, I must confess that I've never really thought about my own shyness in terms of identity or resistance. I'm not really a I'm not really a cheerleader for my own shyness, although I'm not embarrassed about it either. But uh, in order to do this talk and in order to celebrate Hamja's book, which is also uh, part of what we're doing here, I had to think a bit more about the politics of shyness and my own shyness. Um, and um, I suppose the first thing I would say, which might seem quite banal, is that I just think that it's healthy to have a mix of personalities. I think it's healthy to have a sort of jigsaw of human diversity. And I do think there probably is something in um, Susan Cain's argument in her book, Quiet, about introversion, that we are living in an age of the extrovert ideal. Um, and I, I work in a university, and I certainly have um, sensed something like that. There is a kind of slightly exhausting um, sort of jazz hands and teeth um, ethos where you sort of have to be relentlessly positive about everything and say everything is an am amazing and inspiring and exciting all the time. And it's quite hard if you're a, if you're a sort of shy misanthrope like me. Um, that can be a bit exhausting. But I do think it's healthy to have lots of different types of people. Um, and I talk about this a bit in the book, uh, uh, um, that I do think it's a sort of almost an article of faith in our secular society that that um that we should communicate with each other more and better uh, and this is something that's really happened since the second world war that th um sort of theories of business like human relations management theory is basically all about uh, better communication it, it argues that people work better they're more productive when they're consulted about decisions um, you see the same in, in education, actually educational research about not just 
listening to, to, to somebody, not just doing rote learning, but actually uh, actively participating. And all of these things, I think, are generally good. Um, but there is a sort of, um, yeah, there is a sort of fetish almost of talking, that talking in itself is always good. And you see that in the, the architecture of modern life, really, which is the o open plan, the open plan office. Um, libraries and universities now are split into quiet zones and social learning zones. I don't actually think there is any such a thing as, as social learning, really. Um, but um, there's this kind of idea that it's a bringing people together is not just healthy, but also creative and productive. Actually, one of the reasons why we have so many open plan offices is because they're cheap, because they um, cut down on uh, square footage, with cut down on corridors, cut down on linking uh, space between offices. Um, but there is this whole kind of ethos that it will bring people together creatively through spontaneous chance interactions. It can do sometimes, but it's also open. The open plan is a nightmare if you're introverted like me, because the thing about introverts is we are overstimulated in company. So we do need. To, it's not that we're antisocial. It's just that we respond to people diff in diff we, We're differently social, and we do need sometimes to retreat from social life uh, to um, to recover and then to sort of come back. Um, and be sociable again. Um, I suppose the other thing that I was trying to do in the book was to counter um, a trend for, I think, the increasing medicalization of shyness, the, the tendency to see it as something to be cured as a, as a pathology. Um, they talk about, in America, they talk about recovering shy people, like we're, like we're in rehab. Um, and I did want to. I, I, I didn't want to. Um, I, I didn't want to just be relentlessly positive about shyness, but I did want to challenge that idea that shyness was just something to be cured. There is a book uh, came out a few years ago uh, by Christopher Lane called "Shyness: How Normal Behavior Became a Sickness," uh, and he's talking particularly about an American context. Uh, uh, the, 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 I don't know if you've heard of the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Um, this is, has enormous power in America. Basically, you can't get your medical insurance paid unless you have an illness, uh, a mental illness that is, that, has, that is described and defined in the DSM. So the DSM has been incredibly influential in naming disorders like ADHD, like autistic spectrum disorder, and like social phobia, social anxiety disorder. And one of the things that Lane talks about in that book is the way that big pharma, the, the sort of big pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies have latched onto these definitions and they have uh, drugs like uh, Paxil, it's called Siroxat in this country, which was actually originally intended as an antidepressant. Because social anxiety was named in the DSM, Siroxat became uh, retargeted at people with social anxiety disorder. Um, now, Lane's argument is essentially that social anxiety disorder doesn't exist and that um, shyness is, is not a pathology, it's just a uh, Put part of the normal continuum of human experience, and we shouldn't medicalize it in that way. And I have a lot of sympathy with that argument. H having said that, I do think there is such a thing as crippling shyness, and I do think there is such a thing as social anxiety. And I see that in my students a lot as well. I do think that it is, it does seem to be quite a serious problem at the moment is just students not being able to even, young people not being able to be in a room with other people, which is obviously pretty disastrous if you want to be a student because you can't come to lectures, you can't be in class. So I think it is a real thing. And I've thought, thought quite a lot about that, about why anxiety, particularly social anxiety, is such um, it's such a big deal at the moment with, with young people. 
Um, the history of mental illness, the history of mental distress is really interesting. A century or so ago, if people suffered from mental illness, it would be more likely to be hysteria or a fugue state or madness. Nowadays, it's likely to be clinical depression, eating disorders, social anxiety. So why is that? Um, the distress seems to be real. The symptoms seem to be real. I don't think it's just a case that w we found a name for something. Um, there is a historian of uh, a, a, sci a historian of science called Ian Hacking, who wrote a book called um, "Mad Travelers," and he talks about uh, transient mental illness. And what he means by that is really why why do we have things like social anxiety, extreme shyness? that seem to bubble up at particular moments like ours? Why is it, why is it a voguish um, sort of thing to feel? And he talks about this as partly a product of the, the discourses that allow those things to be named. So that is, that is basically Lane's argument, that you have something, you have something, you name something, so you can say, oh, well, I've got depression, or I've got bipolar disorder. Um, and that, that th the fact that it has a name allows you to say that you have that. Um, but he actually says it's not just that. He says that certain, certain kinds of illness have what he calls an ecological niche. There's a, there's a particular set of conditions um, about our own era that, that make social anxiety a particularly current thing to feel and think. Um, so I've thought quite a lot about that, about why crippling shyness might be a very might be a very sort of contemporary problem. I don't really know the answer to any of this, but I do think there is a bit of a crisis of mental health among young people, and I, I don't say that lightly. But I do see a lot of young people as uh, as a, a part of my job. Um, and one of the ways of thinking about mental distress, um, we tend to personalize it in our culture. We tend to think about it in terms of personal responsibility, that it's your responsibility essentially to cure your depression or to cure your mental distress. But one way of thinking about mental distress is that it's a kind of silent protest against the way that society works. So when you are depressed, it's an internalized protest, it's a way of, um, uh, of responding to something that you are anxious about or angry about, but in instead you internalize it, you, you, you bring it on yourself. And I do actually think there are quite a lot of reasons why young people should be angry at the moment, um, uh, in terms of debt, in terms of uh, messed up housing market, in terms of um, the gig economy, insecurity, uh, didn't vote for any of the um, craziness that's being unleashed upon the world at the moment. Um, so I think there are objective reasons why young people should be angry and upset. And, and so, I, so I, I think that sort of makes sense to me, that, that explanation. Um, I think quite a lot about, because I work in a university, I think quite a lot about physical space as well, about... Um, creating spaces for people like me, for shy people and introverted people. I think one of the things that we like is to have places where we can be with other people but not have too many demands placed upon us. Um, so somewhere like this, somewhere you can just kind of chill. Um, uh, somewhere where you're not expected to, where there, where there are not great demands placed upon you uh, can be really helpful because it, because if you are shy or introverted it's not that you don't want to be around other people it's just that you want to control the context um, and sort of regulate almost like a thermostat um, the way that you interact with people I also think um, and you may disagree with this having listened to me for the last 10 minutes but but I I also think that shy people can be 
can actually respond quite well to performance. Um, they can be quite good um, at standing up in front of people. Um, and I think it's partly because uh, you sort of have permission to speak. I've, I've got the microphone, so I, I can sort of shout you down. Um, and um, there is a kind of context and a genre and a sort of structure within which I can communicate with people. So I find that, I, I can find that quite liberating. So I try to help some of my shy students to do that as well, to, 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 to give them a context in which they can speak. Um, and that's all I want to say. So I will hand you over to Hamza again. Big thank you to Joe. I've um, been told there's a big queue outside and this venue is actually at capacity now. Um, the hashtag DIY uh, 2017 is uh, just about under trending, so please keep your tweets going. Um, I'm now just going to talk a bit about the actual book. I first have to tell a big thank you to Bookworks, who published it, who have a stall over there, and um, Rose, who designed the cover. Rose is the graphic designer behind Oomk, who are the, um, who's sitting in the front row, and um, I couldn't think of a better cover or a better graphic designer. And moreover, Rose is shy, so she's actually, she was actually supposed to speak here, but she's too shy. Um, so I've, I, I've felt shy radicals my whole life. Um, it's rooted in the secondary experience of being bullied. And I found that when you got bullied um, as a, uh, sorry, when, when you got bullied um, at school, it was for the mere fact of being shy. And if there was any other demographic category, firstly, it could be registered as hate crime. And, and secondly, you have a history of liberation, which can relate to. So if you're bullied for out of sexism or being a woman, you have the suffragettes, you have the whole movement of feminism. If it, you're working class, you have the trade union movement. If you're black, you have the civil rights movement and Malcolm X and all these tropes can move to other. But as a quiet person, I found I had no actual uh, legency of liberation or no resistance icons. So hence, I just made one up. Um, a lot of the politics of shy radicals and a lot of the neologisms, um, I, I don't talk about the extrovert ideal, I talk about extrovert supremacy as something I'd like to destroy. And um, I don't even respect Susan Cain, who I see as like the Tony Blair of introverts and someone who works as a corporate lawyer and some of the, who I consider a bit of a sellout and a scab and um, someone who monopolizes the industry around herself. So I'd just like to talk about one of my heroes, which is Janice from Mean Girls. Um, so we have a notion of like the intrafada when, when, when shy people revolt, which is in this book and, and how it's embodied. But a lot of the tropes in terms of the teen movie just never leave you for the rest of your whole life. So um, we can think Ed Miliband lost the general election. and People said it was because he was a nerd. Um, whereas we think John Major won the election because he was seen as um, a nerd too. So why does shyness work for... Uh, why does nerdness work for the right and not for the left, um, or in terms of popularity? Um, and, and it takes it to the highest level. So we often hear Donald Trump referred to as the uh, high school jock, for example. And you know, even in my mid thirties, like I still these tropes never leave me. I still feel like the unwanted nerd no one wants to speak to at school uh, every time I'm rejected. So I just like to talk about there is an example of when shy people can take power and take control and change the world. So this is Clement Attlee here. And what's not emphasized enough, Clement Attlee, uh, through his whole life, as the longest leader of the Labour Party and the best Prime Minister Britain ever had, um, who introduced the NHS, decolonized India, and um, is that he was actually painfully, painfully shy for his entire life. And people think these days, because we have figures like this representing the left, um, that. Uh, so we have this problem of extrovert supremacy within leftism. And the thing about um, Clement Attlee is that he was always someone who, um, I mean, he, was so, he would actually come to a meeting, there'd be fired up trade unions, there'd be people like Anur and Bevan, who would say Tories are lower than vermin. And somehow his shot, he would just sit in the corner, do a little crossword or um, a little doodle, and then somehow carry leadership over this whole group of people and uh, so without shy people without introverts we wouldn't have the NHS um, 
Another one of my shy inspirations hero, this is Gareth Pierce, who represented my brother when he was detained without trial and also represented uh, many uh, people from the Guildford Four um, and many of the injustices from Hillsborough, which we heard from. And the thing about, uh, when you see Gareth Pierce speak, she is so muted, so shy, and she, she, she brings, she has a humility about her. She's like, me, 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 she, she's just so um, understated. But when she speaks in this understated way, you, you sort of realize aspects of truth about the state. Um, and then you have people like I know, Aaron Bastani of Navarra Media, who's always like, has his head butt laddie style, which, which sort of I cannot relate to at all. Um, so um, I'm just going to read a bit of an extract from the book. So Shy Radicals, um, I sometimes, it, there's lots of characters in the book, and I get confused between the personas and myself. Um, so Shy Radicals is struggling for a uh, independent homeland called Aspergistan, uh, run under a shy real law system. And um, so I'd like to read this, the draft constitution for um, the Shy People's Republic of Aspergistan. Um, and and I'd, I'd like to also address this point about shyness, introverts, and autistic people not uh, being the same. To me, I don't play divide and rule games. And like, I think to me, it's about a political choice that I built a coalition. And that's why I see the sort of overlapping thing. So this is the Shy People's Republic of Aspergistan. And it has a preamble. It is actually mostly based on North Korea. Um, Shy People's Republic of Asbergistan, we the peoples of Asbergistan, embody the Shy People's Republic of Asbergistan, the sanctuary, beacon, and homeland of oppressed, shy, introvert, and autistic spectrum people, and understand that our nation's crowning principle will serve as a bulk work against the hegemony of the extrovert world order, marking a decisive step towards a fraternal and uh, collaboration and coexistence of all shy peoples in autonomous worldwide union. Acknowledge that successive generations of our people have suffered rejection, bullying, humiliation, belittlement, pathologization, persecution, subjugation, exploitation, erasure, exclusion, alienation, discrimination, and disadvantage at the hands of the global system of extrovert supremacy, which has dispossessed our right of our right to introspective life, self-esteem, equality, and peace. Demand the reversal of operations of extrovert exclusive representation in Congress and debate chambers. Acknowledge the system's failure to listen and represent its subjects and citizens. We take Lao Tzu's dictum, the quieter you become, the more you're able to hear, as a foundational principle of our democratic institutions. Cherish the richness of inner life, silence, contemplation, reflective solitude, intimate company, investigative depths, peer review truth, which forms the basis and legitimacy of the state and government to determine our destiny. Now, I'm just going to go to some of the articles of law which uh, define our state. So, and this is really based on, um, the structure is based on North Korea and also Cuba, Kurdistan, and a mishmash of various revolutionary constitution, including Stalin's second Soviet Union uh, constitution. So it goes, Article 1, the Shy People's Republic of Aspergistan is an independent pan-shy state representing the interests of all shy, introvert, autistic spectrum peoples, herein referred to as Aspergistan. Article 2, Aspergistan is a revolutionary vanguard state guided by anti-systemic introvert ideology which constitutes the world outlook and political identification of the state. Article 3, Aspergistan honors the struggle of the intrafada in the liberation of the homeland and freedom, tranquility, and well-being of shy peoples within and without its sovereign territory. Article 4. Aspergistan shall champion the rights of shy people overseas as defined by international Sharia law and provide diplomatic and emotional support. Article 5. Aspergistan shall reinforce international cooperation and maintain friendly diplomatic relations with subjects and bodies within nations committed to the safeguard of introvert spectrum culture. Article 6, Aspergistan shall pr uh, pursue a separatist part of development independent of popular goal approval against all hierarchical imitation of the extrovert supremacist world camp. Aspergistan shall neither compete nor cooperate with the enemy. Af uh, Article 7, the shy introvert autistic spectral people represent a united front and will permanently resist divide and rule tactics. Our unity is based on our collective experience of bullying and humiliation within the extrovert ruled world. Article 8. Mainstream life has no place in Asbergistan. All politics will remain underground. Article 9. Civic privilege will only be granted to the voice of the unheard. And I'd just like to go into some of the national em emblems we have. And um, that is our flag. Um, you can't read the uh, text there, but it says the world is our corner. 
Um, our flag and our national symbol are three dots. Um, um, so this is a national flag, national anthem and cultural symbols and capital city. So Article 21. The shy radical declares the following a charade and part of extrovert supremacist ideology from which Asperger's Stani seek emancipation. Patriotic public ceremonies, military parades, jingoisms, celebration of state representatives, shallow mythologizing of historical conflicts and tragedy, street parties and flashing firework displays. Article 22. The flag of the Asperger consists of a black flag punctuated thusly, uh, dot, dot, dot. The ecclipses will represent as three dark blue circles, symbolizing silence and the depths of the ocean. The flag, may, uh, the flag will never be publicly hoisted. The flag may be used by citizens wishing to be silently indicate that their request for quiet, solitude, and personal space. It will be shared responsibly with citizens to respect the wishes of the flag burger. Um, Article 23. For sporting and cultural fixes abroad, opposing or hosting countries will require to listen to the national anthem used in seashells. Aspergistan shall ensure the provision of a fit supply of seashells in the opposing team of a uh, represented nation. This shall be uh, equal to the length of public cheerleading displays by extrovert supremacist states. Um, I'm just going to end with the national anthem. Um, Article 24. The national anthem is the sound of a seashell which may be accessed on a 24-hour basis by citizens holding the this, this shell to their ear. Non-citizens outside the current territory of Aspergistan may also access the anthem in this manner. Okay, thank you. Okay. So then, do you want to go? So the next person to speak will be Shukri, who's an interior uh, designer, and she'll be talking about the relationship between extrovert supremacy and capitalism. So, how does the relationship between personality types and the current economic climate render in space? The need for extroverted personalities in a capitalist world is something that has been etched into the something that has been etched into the design of our everyday spaces, from Starbucks counters to working environments. We see this every day, but we may not register this. How does this relationship occur? Why are the majority of our public spaces designed for one specific personality trait? This is due to the changes in our economy. Since the Industrial Revolutions, we have become a consumer-based society rather than a producer-based one, and capitalism has evolved beyond just being an economic system. It has become our culture. Capitalism, like any other cultures, has transformed our way of life. It has affected our language, how we view ourselves, and how we view others, and what we perceive to be the ideal personality type. But before I go on to talking about the ideal, I will like to mention why spatial design and why the built environment is relevant. And as, as the bottom is trying to tell us here, uh, buildings and objects in general aren't passive things. They not only reflect our society, but also subconsciously influence us. The current ideal, as Hamja has said, is the extrovert supremacist. Um, w which we consider to be the charismatic, gregarious, well-spoken and outgoing person. However, these words aren't synonymous to extroverts. S the simple difference between an extrovert and an introvert is where we get our energies from and how much stimulation we can endure. There are many theories on how we process stimulation in the brain as seen on the screen. So designing for the ideal of the extrovert, we're designing a world that is overstimulating for others. And now I'll go on to show you some examples. Joe Moran has already spoken about this, but the, as he said, the current uh, workspace is a nightmare for introverts. In the last century, office spaces have significantly transformed by undergoing a series of revolutions due to gender, political, industrial, and technological changes. Thus, the requirements of a workspace are continuing evolving, and it has also supposedly uh, evolved to accommodate extroverts and the current need to do everything in groups. So we've moved from the, the 1920s Taylorism approach, which reflected Victorian factories, to now the open plan mania. And here's a photo of uh, Foster and Partners' office in Battersea, which looks like a personal hell to me. And it's, in this case, it's not about money or space. It's, this is how they choose to run their architectural firm. And I'll read this quote out by Kane. Uh, open plan workers are more likely to suffer from high blood pressure, elevated stress le levels, 
and to get the flu. So it really doesn't work for extroverts either because you're constantly being distracted by others. You're overhearing someone else's conversation. Um, there is a need for open plan offices, but also we need to accommodate spaces for those who want to work alone, who want to work in solitude. And if we go on to look at uh, restaurant designs, we're, as a society, we're terrible at designing for solo diners. The norm is a table for two, and the seats that are designed for solo, di for solo diners are usually the least desirable ones, such as the counter seats. And companies such as Starbucks and Cafe Nero have decided to design uh, circular tables for solo diners or solo coffee drinkers. Um, so they don't feel alone. So they're kind of telling us that uh, being alone is some sort of something you should avoid. And when you zoom out of society and you look in general like the context of a city, if you look at places like Piccadilly Circus, Shibuya, or like Times Square, these are places in which large people congregate together under brightly lit billboards, but they're also spaces for brand expansion of big corporations. They are overstimulating capitalist spaces. In fact, capitalism and space in the city has almost merged into one, from toilets to uh, escalators, we're constantly bombarded with some form of like advert telling us to consume something. And even when you look at like quiet residential areas, you have these billboards telling us to save ourselves into debt, into buying homes that we can't afford. And even if you're a hermit living at home, you'll still get them delivered to you through your letterbox. So we, we really can't escape this. And the question is now is why? Why do we prefer extroverts and why are they vital in the functioning of the capitalist world? The answer is, is that we need a salesman. We need someone to sell us consumable goods but also we have simultaneously become the consumable good. So when applying for a job or a university, not only do we have to um, have the skills, but we need to have dazzling par uh, personalities, be charismatic. Um, we need to sell ourselves in order to be successful. And I'll go on to my last example, which is Starbucks. And Starbucks is synonymous with capitalism. There was a reason why the queue of protesters outside the Starbucks at the Occupy London demonstration in 2011 were, like, caused an outcry. They saw it as this sort of hypocrisy of anti-capitalist protesters queuing for refreshments at Starbucks. And as Starbucks is the epitome of capitalism in the contemporary capitalist world, you are judged by what you consume. Starbucks doesn't advertise its coffee in the same manner like Heinz advertises beans. It isn't offering you just a product, but it's a lifestyle and experience. Part of, their brand, part of their brand concept is the romance of coffee and to create this third space, as it says here, the extension of the front porch. To create this third space, Starbucks has painstakingly designed their stores to conceive this mellow, laid-back atmosphere. The color, the materials, the textures of the surfaces, the laminated wood countertops, the occasional leather sofa, all give a sense of warmth to the space. The smell is also highly important. All you should smell in a Starbucks store is coffee. The food has been engineered so it doesn't overpower the smell of coffee. The soothing sounds of coffee machines, the sound of me metal milk pitchers, combined with the quiet chatter and music playing, creates a harmonious atmosphere for people to sit down without really being alone. Customer service is also the second and perhaps most critical attribute to Starbucks success. How it sets itself apart from other coffee shops is by placing the espresso machine on the counter so it, they're facing you directly. And everything is designed to be below eye level so that can, they can interact with the customer. The whole countertop and the process deciding what to order to paying has been designed. And it's all designed to allow maximum communication between you and the barista. Uh, the pick up, the order of the counter usually is food section, payment, expression machine, pick up counter. While you are deciding at the food section, you'll be greeted warmly. Then moving over to the payment section, you'll be asked your name. And this is Starbucks way of trying to make it intimate. And then they ask you how you want to customize the drink. So it's, so it looks like it's, a, so it's designed to be exclusively for you. And while you wait for your beverage, you'll notice that the counter, uh, continues with a thin strip behind the espresso machine, and this is designed to like draw you in to the barista. And this is where the second greeting occurs when you engage in forced small talk. And then you finally pick up your, uh, your drink. The role of the barista here is to be warm, friendly, and most importantly, extroverted. And the need for extroversion here has been etched into design. This orchestrated interaction is Starbucks' way of controlling us for their financial gain. 
Through manipulating our emotions, Starbucks wants to nurture a connection between the barista and the customer for both of them to become emotionally invested in the, in the company. Um, to wrap up quickly, uh, Starbucks isn't the only corporation uh, that does this. I mean, another corporation that does this is Lush. Um, you can see it through their design as well. Uh, and in this like, discussion, I've highlighted a lot of problems in the design world, but there are solutions. One of them is voting Chairman Corbyn and establishing full communism. But in other words, there are actually design solutions, but I haven't had the chance to go into them. One of them being Harry Giles' Chill Out Corner. Uh, you can look that up online. And it's important to note that this topic is all based on my own obs observations and reading. It's rather obscure, and I have a lot of research to do. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, so the last person to speak will be Paul Wadey, who's written this awesome book called Gorilla Aspies, which I recommend you all read. Um, yeah, um, he... I, um, my brother was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome and I found reading a lot of the magazines and peer-led uh, stuff around Asperger's syndrome, there are all sorts of discussions about social awkwardness um, and awkward encounters um, for, um, that we just do not see everywhere else. And also as a diagnosed manic depressive, um, I also found ways of redefining uh, your diagnosis, your, your labels. So um, to me, my, my depression was always... Uh, I always thought of it as my body's natural capacity to, to go on strike or my manias as, as attempts to uh, resist the workplace discipline. Um, and um, that's written into the body. And so I've drawn a lot of inspiration from uh, this book, Gorilla Aspies. Um. <coughs> Thank you very much. Very kind. <coughs> Just now I get phlegm in my throat. It's interesting, the body reacts against you when your time comes to speak, start to touch my nose, my throat goes. Uh, I'm what you would call a closet introvert. I spent my life very much shy, uh, kind of disempowered by it in school and would not accept this. So I've ended up this, some would say quite powerful presence, alpha male who is in fact nonetheless still a shy person. It just goes to show that no matter how much you change yourself or you evolve or you develop strategies and techniques of relating yourself and you seem to come over as, sorry, strong and intense and powerful, at heart your nature remains. So we're not some uh, people who've got something wrong, who've got something uh, disordered about you if you're not this Gordon Gecko extrovert. I was referring recently to the greed is good speech from Wall Street. It's very indicative of first world capitalist society and how you've got to be outgoing and can do and able to get to your office at four in the morning. Because a lot of American corporate offices are open at four in the morning, you know. I've got a little presentation about my life here and how I created the book and my ongoing project, Gorilla Aspies, which has got a lot of bearing of everything that everyone has discussed so far. Bear with me, it's all in there somewhere. I was diagnosed autistic at the age of 41. Then I had to work out how to be me for real when my role models in any pre-existing culture of our kind I could find consisted of geeks, obsessives, scientists, the mentally ill and handicapped people in general. I found none of that quite worked for me. I went to Bart's Hospital in 2001 and a consultant psychiatrist said, there is nothing wrong with you. And I've got it in writing. <laughs> uh, it's only three years later I got a proper diagnosis for being autistic. So I wrote a book <clears throat> and created a show for audiences that they could join in as I shared with them my true nature, thus creating an environment in the book, in the show, in which others of my kind could be free and be glad to find themselves. Very much what Hans has created here, what we're trying to create here, I think. A show that other people like me could leave feeling good about themselves, an empowering neurodiverse environment, like the book's meant to be. So I needed a title and a concept for it all, and I chose two words. One, a predication of an underground movement that was not passive, gorilla, and the other is a slang term for my kind, Aspies, Asperger's syndrome. <coughs> A snob term for being autistic and be able to look like you are not, which also implies you have more ability at some things than most people in the world. You have know, savant skill at some sport. Personally, I can't stand the term Asperger's syndrome, but that's how badly our society can impact on some of us. 
We have to have that, you know, justification and identity. Oh, I'm smart, intelligent, sexy, clever. Well, I'm sick of it. I spend too much time in a Buddhist movement. I spent my 30s in it. And I really don't need to define myself as some sort of big, clever winner in life. And it's marvelous to be with other people who talk about introversion, who talk about vulnerability as a perfectly normal facet of themselves and a way of life. Why not? Why do you have to be rich, successful, clever? Why do you have to be smart, intelligent, sexy, and wonderful in, in all these different respects? Why can't you just be at that sort of mean level that is you without boosting it up to be something or, or oh dear, do, I'm, I'm beneath level, oh, I'm so tragic, you're below. Why can't you just be you? So in using Gorilla and Aspie together, you got the concept of a race of people whose only capacity to express themselves in society was often covertly, because they cannot assert themselves like everyone else. We have major issues as autistic people with being part of social groups and collectives, let alone being in ordinary, boisterous social environments such as pubs, clubs, hey, people, places like this, believe it or not, factories, cinemas, buildings with light and sound. I mean, your average autistic person, you're facing these lights, it's like a firing squad, and the sound behind you as well would have a terrible effect. I'm an overstimulator, so I actually get off on this kind of thing which just goes to show how varied autistic people can be. And yet at the same time, we have uniform properties, okay? And we have empathy for our own kind, basis of my marriage. My wife's the same thing, got diagnosed the same year as me. We've been married for 10 years in December. How is that a disability or a disease? When we have this inter um, empathy. Anything stimulating could be a potential minefield for us. Add to that humor interactions, which my kind can often only do to a limited degree. So anyway, the title Gorilla Aspies worked wonderfully as a statement about how autistic people are disempowered by their own natures. A lack of executive functions are hardwired into us. It's part of what makes us our nature. Yeah? It's a medical term. It means that we're literally made not to be able to do certain things. It's like having blind spots in the brain. Oh. Our obsessive natures causing us to behave in ways that are not feasible to pragmatic survival obsessive compulsive it's in there as well we have these we just want to do the same thing over and over again once we get into something attention to detail is everything wishy-washy people oh don't worry about it it's just there somewhere drive you mad where are we i'm not used to working from a script you see uh being unable or unwilling to synchronize with the world around us and not knowing why we should we kind of hide in plain sight we conceal the worlds in our minds we connect in social groups and online in our own sites and social media places in our own unique way, guerrilla style. This is the advent of social media and the internet, late 1990s. We now have a whole global autistic underground. Extroverts unite. <laughs> Introverts unite, I should say. Then I bought a T-shirt. It was like raising a flag or a banner. I spent three weeks non-stop in the Edinburgh Festival last year wearing it day and night. The one I had said, cure neurotypicals now. <laughs> Come on. I throw it away in an abandoning way. Um, I wore it in, ca where are we? I sold books in cafes and even the streets as I flowered for my show, flyer. You give out these flyers in the Edinburgh Festival. I realized I had become a street promoter of positive neurodiversity advocacy just for walking around like that. I'm doing it now with this T-shirt, you see. I res represented a race of people who were all alike whilst being all utterly unique and did not relate to being part of a race. I found them in social group meetings in which they all seemed to have a great time relating about the fact that they did not relate. So I thought, well, how does this make sense? I decided that in any conventional neurotypical sense, okay, neurotypical people average neural makeup of the brain, kind of normal, as we were. Neurodiverse is where we're relatively not the case. And we have various properties which are known by stigmatizing terms like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. Because the first people who categorized us as a kind were psychiatrists, so they called us a perversion of humanity, a, a perversion of a, of a concept of normal that no one can ever quite define. Have you noticed? Right. Where are we? Yeah. The way of people of different races 
sexualities and gender orientations represent their kind to the majority. Neurotypicals, it's kind of, we come over as a minority because they have to, due to the way things have been for them. There was a need to do this to achieve positive representation and respect. So that's what I was doing, to represent autistic people as a valid subset and kind of humanity instead of this uh, clinical perversion. Now, there's an author called Steve Silman who wrote a book called Neurotribes, which is basically the potted history of autistic people as a kind. It goes back about 300 years. Now, he reckons, and he told me personally, that we autistic people rule Silicon Valley as engineers and designers. He also mentions that autistic people are an utter mafia running NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. My dreams come true from when I was a child. In fact, autistic subcultures have existed for a very long time. I mean, just look at any environment devoted to precise academia or technology and engineering. Obsessive interest and absolute faith and devotion. Faith, that's right, monks, nuns, people of, of absolute faith. We have empathy amongst our own kind, as I mentioned. We can form long-term stable relationships with each other. That, for me, is all the proof I need that we are not a disease or a disorder at all. Globally, autistic people seem to have formed an anti-culture culture. culture. We're all the same and all completely different in being so. Each of us personally representing unique takes in being neurodiverse from the neurotypical. I mean, does anyone here actually believe in a normal world? Yeah, I thought so. So I find myself trying to channel what I read from the online community and experience from autistic people face to face in social groups and even in my own marriage. What I find is that some of us suffer more than others. Some of us handle things okay, and some of us appear to. Now, that sounds like the neurotypical world, doesn't it? You see, a lot of us, you think of autism, you think when the autistic person's nature is on top of them, and they are crushed by it, and they are unable to relate themselves because their OCD, ADHD, their sensitivities render them technically mentally disabled, severely mentally handicapped. But a lot of us, it's the other way around. I'm an example of an autistic person on top of his nature. Without positive role models, we are forced to live our lives on the basis of conforming to neurotypical standards and ideals that are not innately natural to us. Dr. Sheldon Cooper is a good example uh, from the Big Bang Theory. Does anyone know the TV series The Bridge? They made one of the central, two central characters an autistic woman called Saga Noren, who's the chief murder squad detective. And there's a detective series called Mr. Monk you should look out with, where the central character is utterly on the autistic spectrum. What of the likes of Temple Grandin, or noted autistic <laughs> figures in the media who are respected for their capacity to relate? What is it like being on the spectrum? Yeah, what about that? Can you think of any who kind of relate themselves like me and say, well, as an autistic person, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, exactly. Where are we? Where are the ordinary autistics in the spotlight? Where are the people you can grow up looking to who handled it okay? We who are determined to be... Okay. One minute sum up. All right. Uh, I had to do something. That's why I'm standing here wearing this T-shirt when I'm a 53-year-old man, and I do not know how to conclude this talk. When I perform my audience conver autism conversion show, the first few years were like exposing my body and mind at the stage at the same time. I would come away shaken and a bit shocked when the show had gone really well. Why? Because I seemed to be evolving a new internal identity. The work I was doing was causing me to evolve. I was experiencing myself as an autistic adult in front of an audience of neurotypicals and autistics alike. It had an effect on me. You've got to remember good or bad are only relative ways to calibrate your experience. I was mutating. I now believe it has led me to be at peace with my new autistic identity, but only relatively, as I do not think that the process is over. So thank you very much uh, for listening to my talk. <laughs> so there's uh, now time for Q&A. Um, there's, there's lots of people who'd like accept, I mean, not everyone actually questions their diagnosis, or, and some of us do, some of us don't. I just want, would anyone want to like comment on that or <laughs> um, like so I mean like uh, you know um, not all some people just accept what say a doctor or a psychiatrist say some people accept social anxiety disorder or find it useful um, I don't know if anyone wants to uh, <laughs> um, 
I, I haven't got a lot to say about that because I've never been diagnosed. Um, I mean, I think, um, I think the thing about shyness is that it, it sort of exists on a continuum. Um, and uh, from, I mean, the, one of the things about writing the book is that um, it, some very unlikely people have said to me that they're shy. It's actually something that people are more, perhaps more inclined to say that they are than, say, introverted or, or on, the, on the autistic spectrum. Um, I think Russell Brand might be one of the people who claims to be shy. Um, uh, but um, so I think this I think it's just um, I think it just is part of I think there's something just very human about being shy it's just about um, the accident of human self-consciousness really which is that we have the ability to to think about other people and how they might see us and yet we will never find out definitively what they're thinking and I think everybody can feel like that um, but I think on the other, at the other end of the continuum, there are these kind of crippling sorts of social anxiety. Um, as I said in the talk, I, I feel very torn about it, actually. I feel very um, hesitant about pathologizing shyness for fairly obvious reasons that I am shy and I don't like to think of myself um, as having a pathology. Um, but I also think it, there have been times in my life when it has been incredibly debilitating and crippling and um, it is a thing, it is something that I have suffered from um, and actually it does help to talk about it and do, it does help to sort of say that, that I have kind of felt those things. Um, but I'll, I don't know. If Society and human environments have got certain parameters. You're expected to come into this room, be able to handle the uh, environment, a lot of people in it, uh, lights, for example, we're on the stage, got to handle the lights in the faces, uh, the noise coming off everybody, uh, being put on the spot to give answers to specific questions. So being shy exists in relation to all that as a property of somebody who is not able to deal with that, um, whose nature is not up to this relative standard of extrovert. You see, it exists in relation to a, an extrovert, a shy, non-shy, somebody who's very outgoing. And I think that rather than, uh, as you say, pathologizing it, you simply have a, a nature and you have a way of working that is natural to you. You have a certain level. I think a lot of us here are made to do things that are unnatural to ourselves all the time, to deal with light, sound, environment, living in a very aggressive city like London. And I'm very glad that to be here. That what you've been saying is you're, you're highlighting that you're made a certain way, and that's natural, but you have to constantly go beyond yourself to deal with the mo most mundane and tiny things, and it has, it has an effect. And why can't we just have a shy city with shy people? And indeed, and the Aspergian country, where it's, uh, it's okay to, be, uh, to operate within your boundaries, is really what I'm saying. I'd like to, um, is there anyone who'd like to share an experience or comment or anything? Uh, please put your hand up. And you can put your hand up in the middle of the talk. I'm going to make sure I'm get to you. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add something. I was thinking about listening to all of you speak. And, I, and there's something to do with, I guess, the question of gender and specifically masculinity um, and shyness and gentleness and kindness, which is, you know, obviously actively discouraged in a way um, in the upbringing of boys um, and the socialization of men. And I think, I don't know, there's something very moving and important about hearing men speak about vulnerability and gentleness. Um, and I'm quite interested in thinking about how we encourage a culture in which those things become more prominent and more celebrated in a quiet way. <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, I, just discussing these kinds of feelings is really important, basically, in public. I just wanted to, to say that. I think it's all about getting real, isn't it? Oh, 
Oh, I just want to, so Shukri and uh, Nina, they're both uh, active activists, and I've identified this problem of extrovert supremacy on the left. Um, I just want to wonder if you, I you know, like I go to Occupy meeting and they're like wiggling their hands and they go clubbing, and I always feel like left out in this, this space, and I find they claim non-hierarchical equality things, but it's always that loud people who just, just dominate, who represent, who become chairs, heads, presidents, parliaments. So I'd just like to th uh, both of you to comment about, uh, yeah, extrovert supremacy within activist communities. Okay. This is a rather random note, but it's about like um, shy leaders. So if you look at like uh, the biblical accounts and like the Quran, Prophet Moses used to stutter, but yet he led a nation out of Egypt. And in general in Islam, there's a whole thing about noble shyness and hayat. So it's kind of um, readdressing how we look at shyness and looking at it as like a noble trait that leaders have had, like Clem Attlee and so on. This is, I don't know if it's related or not. Yeah, I think it's a really, really tricky question. I'll just say a little bit about it. I mean, I was, I've also been thinking about this Pascal quote um, where he says, you know, all the evil in the world stems from man's inability to sit still in a room. And I think there's something very profound about that. Um, I think one of the problems we have with political organizing is what we're competing with. You know, how do we get people involved in campaigns? I mean... If you think about the kind of uh, anti-Iraq war march, you know, the sort of millions of people in the street in 2003, you know, I, I remember thinking at the time, you know, there's something a bit distasteful about the sort of celebratory tone of it, the kind of loudness, you know, what would might make more of an impression is maybe everyone wearing black marching in silence, you know, to actually reflect on the kind of horror that, that Britain was, you know, launching itself into and, and the, you know, in terms of thinking about those who would be killed and those who would suffer. Um, and I think we probably do need to think very carefully about how we not just organise politically, but how we protest symbolically. Um, and I think there is a, a, a tradition perhaps of, of quiet or silent protest, things like die-ins, I suppose. I mean, simple kind of um, forms of resistance that are maybe, yeah, are kind of... Um, I don't know, celebrate a certain kind of silent stance. Um, but, uh, but I think it's difficult. It is true in organizations, you do tend to have, you know, the kind of the best speakers become leaders, you know, the most sort of forthright and sociable people. Um, I don't necessarily think that's always a bad thing, but I suppose one of the interesting things about Hamja's book is that he reverses the term. I mean, how do you oppose something like extroversion or extrovert supremacy? as he describes it, you can't respond to it on its own terms, you know, and so there's always going to be this question, well, it, will that just lead to a kind of passivity or passive resistance or apathy or withdrawing from the world? And that's not what Hamja proposes, but it, it's a kind of, um, I don't know, very tricky question, how we, how we oppose something uh, not on the terms of our oppressor. Yeah.